All right, so let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening, and I just pray that you would bless us now as we study Greek. And as we're coming to the end of it, Lord, I pray that you would just give us clarity of thought and, and help us to understand things that will help us understand your word better. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so perfect tense um, is what we're looking at tonight. And um, so we've got on here, we've got this side is new vocabulary. This side is old vocabulary in the perfect tense. Okay, so um, in the book, he just puts them all in alphabetical order. I've divided them up, so it's a little easier. So first one we'll look at is genao. And genao is think uh, generate, okay, or generation. Um, and so genao is I beget or I, yeah, I guess I, we don't really have another word for that in English besides beget, I guess. It's, I make someone be born. <laughs> so, yeah. I born somebody. Give birth to. Yeah, give, give birth to, but if it's a... If, just the word birth. I, yeah, to birth something. But um, yeah, but this could be used of a man too, right? So so we don't really have a word besides so beget is kind of the I mean that's an old word, but it's one we use. Okay, um generate would be it, I guess. Um then we have Engitso, Engitso, that's, we had a word last week, Engus, which is um, near. And so Engitso is I draw near, or I come near. And um, maybe I was trying to think of a way to remember it. What about um, if you edge near somebody? That's a good Engitso, one. Engitso, sort of, I don't know, sort, sort of helps a little bit. Uh, edge closer to somebody. Then we have uh, martyreo, and that's like martyr. See, martyr in there. And that's eyewitness. Bear, to bear witness, to testify. Um, and a martyr is somebody who bears witness with their life, right? Testifies. And that's used all through the Bible. Um, then we have Petros. This is Peter. Um, it's also a very good, well, it's not Petros, actually. I think it's Petra. It's a great restaurant in San Luis Obispo, <laughs> a Greek restaurant. Mm -hmm. Remember there? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Stop it. Petra. It's, it's, oh, man. It's great. Um, anyway, then we have Playrao, and Playrao is I fulfill or I fill. Um, maybe think I have a full plate, Playrao. Yeah. Uh, but it's I I fill I fulfill anytime where it says like if it says the scripture was fulfilled, it would be play coming a form of play rao. Um, I think how else they would use it. Um, when Jesus says that your joy may be full, it's it comes as a form of that. So yeah, so those are new words, and so then over here we have old words in the perfect tense. And um, so see if we can figure out what words these are. Um, akeka, akeka. And what's that one look like to you? Akuo, to hear. So it's, um, it's a oh, perfect yeah. form of hear. Then we see babaptizmai. What's that look like? Yeah, baptize. Yep, yep. So it's the perfect of to baptize. Mm -hmm. Then we have ge gegona. You can know school. No, it's close though. Get on my. Yes. Get on my to become. Is that one? And then we have uh, gegrapha. You see the grapho I write. Oh, yeah. Then we have egg, 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 
I get gear tied. I get gear tied. Well, it's like it's like my <laughs> mouth phone. <dude. laughs> a gig is a gig air time a gig air time a gig air time okay yeah a gig air time wow anyway what's that one look like any idea yeah a garo which is i raise up yep. um then we have egnoka that one's from gnosko i know then we have Eleluthe. That one doesn't look anything like it. Not Luo. In fact, this one. Yeah, what, just just, think, think, think of some of your most irregular verbs. Um, uh, Erko my come go. It's from mm -hmm. that. I mean, it does it does it have share any of the same letters? I don't, Wow, Erico, my, wow, yeah, it shares an epsilon and an alpha, and that's it. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Um, then we have erethane. Erethane. Any ideas for that one? That one's doesn't look like a lot either. That one's very irregular too. That's from Lego. Whoa. Yeah, let's say. Then we have hero orica. 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 That one again looks nothing like from Blepo. <laughs> oh see. Long, man. Yeah. So these three are super irregular. And then this one, Tethneka. Okay, that's it comes from a, a root verb that we've not had yet, but we had something similar. Apothnesco to to kill. Okay. Um there's a thnesco, uh, which is which is to kill as well, but it never shows up in the New Testament. It only ever shows up as this form. And so um if it's if it's ever like um any other form besides the perfect. It will be from a, a Pothnesco so for oh, some man. reason. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that's our vocab. So let's talk about the perfect tense now. Um, we're going to look at, that's what he does. We're going to look at the, uh, just the forms of the words first, and then we'll, and how to make the words. And then we'll talk about what it means, how you translate it. Okay. So, um, so the perfect tense, um, the perfect active indicative, let's do this. Let's use our friend Luo. Okay. So for the perfect active indicative, we have our regular present active indicative is luo. And so the perfect form of luo is going to be like this. Leluca. Leluca. That's what uh, Luca Doncic is called in France. Leluca. Mm. <laughs> Come on, James, give me a laugh. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um the so um we'll come back a second. Let me just do all these up. So the present so the perfect active infinitive of Luo is going to be La Lu. Can I? A loop, can I? Then the perfect active participle. This is just the your basic, you know, the nominative singular 
and it's going to be like this. The glucose. The glucose. Okay. So, um, no, do you notice something that's happening here? We see the blue, 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 blue there. So let's look at see see what are, what are some of the same things that are happening. We have something called a reduplication. Okay, so they take the first letter of the root, and then you put that letter at the beginning with an epsilon in between, and that's called a reduplication. Wow. Oh. And so we have that there, right there. And then we have something else. We have a kappa. And those are the two things to look for. So in the ending of the words, it in between the, the root vowel there and the last vowel of the root, there'll be a kappa and then the ending. Okay, and that's... That's the thing to this, that really distinguishes the perfect tense. In most cases, that's what you look for. So um, the perfect tense, so when, when you look up in the back of your book and you've got the different forms of the verbs, okay, you have, first of all, the present form. Okay. Then we have next, there's a future form. Luso, and then there's the aorist form, and that's elusa. And then the fourth one in your book is a perfect active form, leluca. Okay. So, so when you look up in the back of your book, a vocabulary word, a verb, it will have the different forms, what is it, like six, I think, forms, and six different um, stems, present stem, the future stem, the error stem, the perfect stem. Um, and then there was, um, we learned, let's see, the, or five, six was error's passive stem, like that. And, um, but the perfect is going to be the fourth one. Um, let's see here. Um, one thing that you won't find, he doesn't even cover in the book really here, is um, he just mentions that the perfect active subjunctive is so rare, it's not even worth looking at, okay? So probably, I don't, I don't know how many times it's used, but probably a couple times in the New Testament. So uh, let's see here. So let's talk about how you... How a, a perfect tense verb is formed. Okay, so and and we don't you don't need to know this because you're not going to be forming these verbs, but you need to be able to look back and recognize them. So if you have a verb stem that begins with a vowel or a diphthong, then something different happens to the reduplication. So, like on uh, for Luo, the Beginning letter of the stem is a lambda. Okay, let's take the word el pizzo, which is I hope. And so the stem, it's going to begin with a, the root is going to begin with an epsilon. And so what it turns into instead of re so how do you reduplicate an epsilon, a vowel like that, with a, another epsilon in between, right? <laughs> that, that, that just wouldn't work, okay? So instead, what it does is it lengthens. So it does. El pica. So this, the reduplication, it just lengthens. With a word with a the root begins with a vowel. Um, another one would be etao, etao, to ask. And um, again, here we have it beginning with a diphthong. 
two vowels. And so that's just going to lengthen to an eta. Eteka. Eteka. Like that. So that's one thing to recognize. So, so like normally you're looking for this reduplication, but sometimes it's a little bit hard to see if you have a word that begins with a vowel. Because sometimes that just is going to look like an augment. Right? That's where it gets confusing. So in that case, what I'm looking for is the kappa. Mm -hmm. See that? And that's going to distinguish it. Because like a regular, like an, a regular aorist verb, um, like um, elusa, you're not going to find a kappa in there. You're going to see the sigma in there. So, um, Ross, in the, in the first case, is it always an epsilon? The, um, no, I mean, if any any word that where the root begins with a vowel, it's going to like. No, I, I, I meant in the very first case with Luo. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you duplicate and then you just always add the epsilon. Yeah, the epsilon is good. Oh, oh, okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Good question. Um, so then if you have a verb stem that begins with two consonants, okay, um, it the reduplication does something. So let's look at grapho. And so this begins with two consonants. Mm. And so it's going to, sometimes it will reduplicate, but not always, okay? Um, like here, it will turn into a grapha. Gegrapha. Okay, that, that just looks normal there. And so sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Now, the weird thing is he gives me the example of Gnosko, okay? Problem is that Gnosko doesn't begin with two consonants. Now I'm thinking maybe the root, the actual root of Gnosko is gamma nu, maybe. Maybe there's not, but, um, but anyway, Gnosko turns into Agnoka. Egnoka. And for some reason, this doesn't reduplicate. It just, they just add the epsilon there. And so instead of doing like a, maybe because there's two consonants and then they're not sure which one, you wouldn't add two consonants or something. I don't know, but it just sometimes adds the epsilon. But in that case, again, what I'm looking for when I can't see the reduplication, I'm, I'm looking for the kappa. Mm -hmm. um, how do you tell what it's going to be? What's that? If, how do you tell if there's going to be a kappa? If there's going to be a kappa? Then yeah, because there isn't always. Not always, most of the time. So you're looking for it most of the time? Yep. Okay, then let's do this. So then if, if your verb stem begins with a B, a theta, or a key, um, the reduplication is going to turn into a different letter. Okay? So let me show you this one. Like So we have the let O and begins with the V. And so here's what it's going to do. It's going to be a the filica. So the instead of doing a reduplicated phi, it's going to turn into a p. Again, they're they're related, right? Are they both? What is that? Labials, I think. We use your lips. Um. Then uh, let's see. 
if you have a verb stem that ends with a vowel, um, many times the, the vowel is lengthened before the kappa. So let me show you, like a agapao. And that turns into Igapika. Igapika. Yeah, that sounds like a science fiction thing. Agapica. Mm -hmm. But uh, so what's happening here, it begins with a vowel. So the reduplication is just the lengthening. And then um, it ends with a vowel here. This is a contract verb. And so this vowel lengthens before the kappa. Uh, let's see. Then if you have verb stems ending, yeah, there's more, okay. We have verb stems ending with these letters, with tau, delta, or theta. Um, here's what it's gonna do. We have like, okay, okay. So with El Pizzo, the actual stem is El Pete, okay? And so when it turns into perfect, it does this. El Pica. And so what happens is, this consonant is dropped before the kappa. I, think, I don't think it happens very often, but that's, he's just throwing that out there so you, so you know. And then in some verbs, there is no kappa, <laughs> right? That's the frustrating thing because you, you got a rule and you think it's gonna be a rule and there's an exception to the rule. So this is on page 186 at the very top. He says, some verbs have a second perfect, which is conjugated like the first perfect, except that there is no kappa. Mm -hmm. ah. So every once in a while, there'll be one, like uh, grapho turns into gagrapha, and there's no kappa in there. And maybe it was just too hard for them to say, or I don't know. I don't know why. Okay, so that's, that's your perfect, and how the perfect is formed, perfect, active. Now, when you get to perfect, middle, and passive, um, do this. So we have these different stems. We have this stem, the fifth is perfect, middle. And uh, for Luo, that's going to be Lalumai. Lalumai. And so the perfect middle has its, and, and passive, middle passive are the same and imperfect, has its own stem. Just like Eris passive has its own stem. So, um, oh, let's see here. So with the perfect middle, what we're going to see is it's got the reduplication but it doesn't have the kappa. Kappa is missing there. Perfect active is gonna have reduplication and most of the times the kappa, but perfect middle passive, no. Um, so I've got a sheet that I gave to you. This sheet is a magic sheet, okay? <laughs> it's, it's all your verb forms. Because this, this is the, we've learned all the verb forms now. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And so this is that. Okay. So, so if you have this sheet out with you when you're translating something, it, it's, it should show up on here. Um, now, that's very similar to the verb chart in the back of the book. Yeah, on page C, section 589, it's got the regular verb, 
and it's got all the forms of Luo there. And um, the one thing, the one thing, this is, th these are all the verbs in the indicative. Okay. So this verb, his, his master verb chart there has like subjunctive, imperative, infinitive, all that. This is an indicative here. So couldn't fit all those on the same sheet. So without it being really small. So, um, yeah, so let's see. Okay, one other tense that he doesn't even give us any forms for because it's used very rarely in the New Testament. It's called the pluperfect, okay? And it's, it's formed on the, on the perfect stem, uh, but the pluperfect is called. And, um, oh, sorry, yeah, formed from the perfect and the perfect middle. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second on, on how that is translated, what that means. So let's talk about what a perfect tense means now. How do you, how do you use it? How do you translate it? So um, in, okay, page 187, the, the last section, 452, this sentence is good. The Greek perfect tense denotes the present state resultant upon a past action, okay? So a perfect tense is basically, it's expressing a present state that you're in right now that results from something that happened in the past, okay? And sometimes with the perfect, they're focusing, it always has both of those ingredients in it. Sometimes in the sentence, it's thinking more of what happened in the past, and sometimes it's thinking more about where you are in the present but it has both those ideas in mind, okay? If you're talking about just something that happened in the past, just generally speaking, what tense would we use? Aorist. Aorist, yep. If we were talking about something that continually happened in the past, what would we use? Imperfect. Imperfect, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if, if then you are talking about something, so the perfect is, is, is actually very, um, you want to say it's very specific, right? Um, so it's not going to be used all that often, but when you're using it, you're using that one for a reason. Aorist is just kind of general, right? But, but perfect tense is very specific. So I'm talking about something that happened in the past, okay, back here, but it's like a present state right now that's resulted from this past thing that's happened, okay? Now, a pluperfect is basically all of this in the past, okay? So a pluperfect is something that happened in the past which caused the present state which was, which actually now is in the past. So that's, that's rarely used. Okay, you can see why. Um, okay, so um, here's the way he gives an example. He, on page 188, this whole long section, where he tries to explain perfect tense. Okay. And uh, here's the example he uses. Okay, so if you have somebody that goes to a prison guard and they ask the question, what is your relationship uh, to such and such prisoner? And the prison guard answers, I have released him. Okay. Um, so the, the prisoner was released in the past and his present state is, is freedom. Okay. So that would be like an example of a perfect tense. And a lot of times we would translate it. And I, just, I always translate them in that way. I have done something or this um has happened like that um and it, the english doesn't express it completely but it's the best we can do now a lot of times in in the bible in the translations a lot of times they just translate it like a present because it's it is talking about a present state sometimes it's hard in english to express the, that it's resulting on something that happened in the past so Sometimes it's just translated like a present. Sometimes it's translated like a sort of a 
a pass, like a, this has happened. Um, so yeah, so that's how you're going to try to translate it. Now, flu perfect. If you ask that same prison guard, okay, what was, your, what was your relationship to that prisoner? And he says, I had released him. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the past I released him, which resulted in him being freed, but he committed some other crime. He's back in jail again. Right. So I had released him in the past. And so that would be like a flu perfect. And so, yeah, it doesn't have, you don't use that very often. All right. Um, let's well, another see. example would be just so I have the right. Somebody says, what happened to so-and-so? And you say, I have forgiven him. Yes. Is that a good, is that an example? That would be a great example. Yep. Okay. And what you're expressing is I forgave him in a moment in the past and now he, his present state is being forgiven. Okay. Yep. Yep. If, if, if you were using an aorist, you would just say, I forgave him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. And adding the, I have forgiven him is, is making it present tense. Or sorry, uh, perfect tense. Yep. Um, okay, one perfect that you're going to see quite a lot in the Bible is this one, based on grapho. A grapti, and um. This is this is going to be this is basically I it has been written. So this is a third person singular. It has been written. And so when it's talking about the scripture in the Old Testament, um, and usually it's just translated, it is written. Because I mean in English you could you could express the perfect in either way, right? You could say it is written because we're, you're focusing on the present state and and yeah, it's in a written state. So with in English, when we just when we say that, it actually is expressing what the perfect implies. Or because written is past. Yeah, because written is past. Yes. Um, so but you could also express that with it has been written. And that would express the same thing. So but you're gonna see that a lot. That's that's one of the places where you really see the perfect used a lot. Anytime that anytime the scripture quoted in the New Testament, it usually has a perfect tense. It has been written or it is written. Yep. Yeah, it's passive. Yes. Uh, let me see. Is that, yeah. Yeah, because that would be, let me look at my, yeah, that would be um, perfect, passive, third person singular. Um, oh, let's see here. When you translate the perfect of Erechomai, I come, um, in English, you can say, I am come. Okay. But you could also say, I have come. Or uh, with Genomai, to become, I am become, or I have become. Either one you could do. Okay, so let's um, put this into practice with some scripture. I just yeah. have one question. On That's that example there, the grapho, or how, is that how you pronounce it? Uh -huh. That's an example of something that didn't add the kappa, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that one doesn't have the kappa. Yep. Okay. And um, for two reasons. First of all, because grapho doesn't take the kappa, and because it's, it's passive. And the passive, perfect passives don't have the kappa. Oh, okay. Yep. So. Okay, so let's look. There's a couple scriptures that came to mind that um, where the perfect tense really makes the difference. And so one of those is in Revelation. So Revelation 3.20. And this is a familiar verse to most people. But let's look at it in Greek.
Almost there. That's a long one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Let's read this thing. Okay. So, Idu, Esteka, Esteka, Epi, Pain, Thuron, Kai, Kruo, Yen, Tis, Akuse, Case, Phones, Mu, Kai, Anoi, Anoise, Anoise, Tain, Thuran, Ace, Elusomai, Pros, Auton, Kai, Dape, Neso, Met, Autu, Kai, Autos, Met, Amu. Okay, here we go. Okay, now I see a perfect tense verb. Look for a word with a kappa in there. The second one. Yes, right here. Esteka. Esteka. So this is from Istemi, um, which I think we're going to, is in some of the last chapters. Okay. So um, very common verb, but it's uh, to stand. Okay. Um, so, so this is a perfect tense. And let's look and see what form it is here. Okay. It's just the um, present active first person singular. So, so if it's perfect tense, we would translate it, I have stood. Okay. Now we have idu, behold. Behold. I have stood. Okay. Um, Tain Duron. That sounds a lot like what it actually is. Door. Okay. Dur. Okay. Duron. Okay. So the door. Oh, Thuron. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking English. Okay. Thuron. Um, Epi, normally we translate that as upon. Um, think upon the doorstep. So we would say at the door. Okay. Behold, I have stood at the door and cruo, okay. um, that's a word I don't recognize. So I look up in the margin here, number 29, it says, and it tells me it's a present active indicative, first person singular, I knock. Okay. Mm. So, and I am knocking. Okay. okay. Ian, if this is uh, anyone, or it could be someone, either two. Um, okay, a kuse. Um, it, it sort of looks like it could be future, but there's another thing it could be. So let's look at the future here on, the, on our magic chart. Okay. Um, yeah. Did I make a mistake on the magic chart? This future second person singular middle, I think it's supposed to have an iota. Subscript underneath. I'm not sure. Okay, I'd have to look that up. Yeah, it's in the back. But um, let me see if it's supposed to. It is supposed to. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, it looks like it could be that, but another thing that it could be is a subjunctive third person singular. Third person. Yeah, of uh, an error subjunctive, because that also will have the sigma. In fact, it's it would be the same form. 
it would be written the same way as the future. So it's either second person future um, middle or it's third person heiress subjunctive. Okay, so let's, let's try to translate it as second person future middle. Um, you will hear. If anyone, you will hear. Not going to work. So if anyone should hear, that works. So okay. That's be third person, not second person. Exactly. Yep. And one other thing tips me off about that, Ian. I think that that's usually used the subjunctive. So, yep. If it's putting it in the kind of subjunctive category, right? Something that may happen or might not happen. Okay, so if anyone should hear the voice, my voice of me, okay. and okay, this one, um, I think I, oh, yeah, this is supposed to have a subscript there too. So, um, anoint say. Uh, let's see if it's in, no okay. Um, mm -hmm. Anoig, an, anoigo, right? Oh, yeah, anoigo is. If you're anoigo, go. Okay. I huh. open the door to go. Okay, so it's I open. Yeah, and should open, so it's going to be the same as this. Open the door. Okay. Eliuso my. Yes, it is. So we have ace, then Eliuso my. Eliuso my. That's it's it's one of the irregulars, right? So, um, and if you know the verse, what do you think it is? Oh, come in. Yeah. If it so if it, if it's a regular first guess, think Erikomai, because Erikomai is one of the most common words. And if it's 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 a very irregular one. So if, if you see a word that's irregular and you don't recognize it, think Erikomai first and see if that fits. If it doesn't, it might be like to say or to to receive or yeah, like that. So but yeah, so it's it's come into. So um, and this is a future. Um, I will come in okay. to him and, and okay. This one is a word I don't recognize. It's not used very often. And on the margin here, it gives me a number 30, future active indicative, I dine. Oh. to eat to eat a meal with and i i will dine met out to with him him and and him or he with emu me Okay, so now the way it's translated, the way I memorized it in King James is, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And so they translate the perfect like it's a present, right? Because they're, they're looking at it as the talking more about the present state, okay? But if it was, if he was only thinking of the present of here he uses a present. Okay. So the question is why? What's going on? So he's, I, th I, I think what's being expressed, and this is this was written to the church in Laodicea, right? And so I think what's being expressed is that Jesus is saying, I have come to the door and I'm standing here now. Okay. And I'm I am knocking. And I think what is being expressed is that he may have been standing there for a while before he started knocking. 
Okay. And so he's come to the door, he stood there and he's waiting for them to let him in. And they don't realize he's standing out there because they're too busy doing whatever they're doing. Right. And so then he starts knocking and, um, and kind of the, the knocking and it's, it's, it's picturesque language. Right. But the knocking there, I think is, he sent, just sent a letter to them. Right? Or, or is it, I'm knocking and you don't even hear my knocking. So I got to send you a letter. Right. So you'll open the door. Right. So that's the idea. And, and the idea I think is, Picture the people in Laodicea, they're in a church meeting, probably either in somebody's home, probably in somebody's home in those days. And so they're in a church meeting and they're busy doing all their own stuff. And Jesus isn't even present, right? He's outside the door and because they never invited him in, right? And so he's now he's knocking at the door. Like, like when um, um, in the book of Acts, when Peter was in prison and they have a prayer meeting and then he's released. And he's outside knocking at the door and they're busy praying for Peter. And they don't, you know, the, so the yeah, servant, right. and she sees his Peter and shuts the door and goes in and tells everyone <laughs> Peter's still out yeah. there. Yeah. Kind of like that, except, except not so funny. Right. So to have Jesus outside, but yeah, that's, that's the idea. So this actually happened. So this is, well, it's, is it a vision or a, no, it's it's more like it's more like what Jesus is okay, he's so John's on the Isle of Patmos, right? The church right. in Laodicea is in Asia, um, in Turkey. So Jesus at the beginning of Revelation gives seven messages to seven different churches. And so this is the message to the church in Laodicea, and he's saying, It's like I'm out standing outside of your door and I'm knocking, you don't even know I'm there. Right? Okay. Not that he's literally out there knocking. Um because yeah. Oh, and the meaning is that they're they're do, they're not doing what they should be doing as a church. Absolutely, right. And so so that's the one where they it says that they were um they they were they, that's the one where they're lukewarm. Right. And they said, We're I'm increased with goods, we have everything we need. And so it's like almost like they don't need Jesus. And so they're just going about daily business without really needing him. So like you said, this is an as it's it's an as if. Yeah, kind of like a using like this. Yeah, like a metaphor, like using yeah, parable, kind of kind of like using um figurative language to express a point. Yeah. And so so then he says, um, if anyone opens the door, I'll come in. And I'll dine with him, he with me. So it's basically, you know, recognize that you need me. And when you do, I'll come in. We can fellowship together. And we'll be, you'll be close to me again. That's kind of the idea. Well, I, I, um, I think that I remember, it, like you said, the, the form that's used for knock is just, and I knocked, right? Just a... Uh, it's 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 present tense, so it's I I am knocking. But when you translate it that way, it made it kind of more um, immediate and almost kind of frightening. Yeah, that's, like he, he's he's putting you there, like I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking, and it makes you think, yeah, you're there with him, as opposed to I just sort of sort of knock on yeah. the door. It's it's like it's like they they get the letter of revelation, and when they read that, they're like, oh, he's knocking right now. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's and he's what been I mean. standing there for a while. That's why he had to give this vision to John so that John would write it and send it to him. Yeah, because what it makes me think is how long has he been standing there? Like I would, I would reflect back on my life with that church. Like, wow, how long has this been going on? Right, probably as long as they felt they didn't need him. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's kind of it's kind of comforting that. Um... He says, if anyone opens, I will dine with him. So that kind of makes it sound like even if the church is really bad, if someone in the church is secret, yeah. They, yeah. Can still, they can still experience God. Yeah. If even, the, even if none of the, the rest of the church. If the servant girl hears it and goes and opens the door, right? <laughs> He'll come yeah. yeah. Wow. Or, or like in one of the other churches, I think he said, like, 
there are some there who haven't been filed in garments. Right. And they're worthy. Yes. Even though the other ones in the church are not. Right. Right. Yep. yep. Now, does that mean I will come into them like I will come into your heart, your soul? Kind of like I, I mean, it's it's the it's still the analogy of the building, right? And I'll come in to the oh, I, okay. the church meeting. I'll I'll come into the church meeting and and we'll sit down. And we'll we'll dine together, which which even sort of a picture of communion, right? Communion service. Yeah. So, so um, so it, it tells me too that they were probably doing communion services with Jesus outside the door. Right? Yikes! So they were going yeah. through the motions of it, and yeah, yep. So yeah, now now this this verse is usually interpreted that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart, and um, which I think it, I mean if if you if you see the analogy. That could be implied, right? Um, but it's, it's, I always wondered as a kid, what does it mean that he's knocking at the door of my heart? What does that mean? Right? It never made sense to me that my heart has a door. What's this, what's this, you know, and I don't know. It just kind of, yeah. But uh, it's, I think it's that idea. It's, it's, it's more he's writing to a church, not just to one individual. Yeah. 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 So that's a, I remember the first time I, I saw that, oh, that's a perfect tense. That, Wow, that makes it a little more powerful. Mm -hmm. it made the stand ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it made my stand. And I'm not going away. You know, I'm, I've been standing here for a while. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do one more. And this one, one is, this one is good too. Okay, they're all good, right? But it's the Bible. They're all good. But um, this one's Galatians 2.20. By the way, the sound's been perfect. Okay, good, good. Huh. Perfect for a perfect tense class. <laughs> <laughs> the sound has been perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, the sound has been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Present state. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Galatians 2.20. Another pretty familiar verse. But it's great to take the familiar verses and look at them in Greek because it gives you some new insights to them. I'll just put the second word. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Paul loves his long words. Man. <laughs> okay.
Nice. You got a word. Interesting couple forms of it. Yeah. Is there a Whittle song, a DW Whittle song to this? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, okay. I, 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 didn't we do this for a V? a V? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It's the wrong verse. Yeah, part part of one of his songs is part of this. Okay, here we go. Uh, Christo, soon as <laughs> our Romai, zo de ukete ego ze de en emoi Christos pa. De noon zo and sarki and pisse zo te to quiu to feu to agape santas me kai paradontos elton huper emu. Okay. A lot of little words in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's our first verb. And that one will give the verse away. <laughs> yeah. So um, so what we have there is so in number 25 on the side from um, Sustarao. Which is to crucify together with, okay, and it's a present uh, passive indicative, first person singular. So, um, starao, uh, is it starao or starazo my? Yeah, starao is to crucify, and the uh, soon on the front is with, so to crucify mm -hmm. with, to crucify together with. So we're going to translate it. I have been crucified, yes, uh, together with, okay, yeah, wow. or actually, actually, we don't have to put the with there, the with is expressed in the dative. With Christ. So with Christ, I have been crucified together. Okay. But, but I live. Or I am living. Um, is, uh, so let's see. Um, Okay, comma. Okay. So, yeah, so uketi is, um, okay, we have not, and we have eti, uk and eti together. So eti is like still, yet, uk is not. So usually we translate this no longer. Or not yet, uh, could be not still, No longer I, 
but is living or he lives in me me who lives in me christ christ okay yep so we have here nominative case here we have dative case mm. yep so christ live but but christ lives in me but okay this is um that's not that's not the okay it would be the if you didn't have the accent mark just fall without the accent mark would be the but this is a, a relative pronoun so it's going to be what or which that which oh, what. okay okay but i'll say what now live i live in in Flesh. Sarki. But. Flesh. Okay. In. Okay. Okay. Piste. I trust. 13 trusts. I think it's. This is. I think it's just a dative of. Of. Like. Um, oh, of. Pistis. Yeah. So. In faith or by faith, everyone say it. Faith. I live. Live. Okay. Now, here we have something interesting. So this is the date of case, date of singular. So it actually goes with this day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but it's it's a when you see the article like removed. From the word, um, what it's doing—it's not just a regular article saying the faith, uh, but it's 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 expressing this whole phrase is modifying faith. Okay, so I live uh, uh, in faith. I live the or the. of the son of God faith. Okay. You're, it's like, you're expressing that. And so a lot of times it will be translated. Like, um, I live in faith, uh, which is of the son of God, or, uh, that is of the son of God. And, and usually you have to add a verb in there in English. You don't have to do that in Greek, but it's basically saying the son of God of the son of God faith. It's literally what it's saying. So the, I'll do of the son of God. Okay. Now we have a participle. And I know that because we got a, a article there. And it's a genitive singular. I know from the article. And of agap, agapao. Loved. Yeah. So um, the one who loved. Or the one who loved, yeah. This I believe is an error as participle, so we'll do love instead of loves. Loved me and Paradontos. Sounds like a dinosaur. Paradontos. <laughs> uh, but it comes from paradidomai. Uh, ditto me um, is we've not had that so one of the last lessons there's there's several common verbs that he saves toward the end just because they're very irregular so uh, but so ditto me is to give para ditto me um, would be to to give to give over yourself or to it, it's a it's a word that would be like uh, to deliver um it could be used if it's used in a bad sense. It's like it's like betray, mm -hmm. like Judas betrayed Jesus. It's the same word, but in a good uh -huh. sense, it's like you're delivering yourself over to something like that. And so, um, so in Judas' case, he gave over Christ. Yeah, he gave him over to the soldiers. Yeah, but he sold them. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Is and, it use that word? Yes, it does. Okay. Yep. 
So um, it, it, this word is also used for, um, I think it's when Paul talks about the, um, oh, I, I, in First Corinthians, um, I'm giving what I deliver what was delivered to me. Now I'm delivering to you. Mm. That so it's the a message he's delivering. He's giving giving it over. So it can be used in a good or a bad sense. So so this is see the it's it's the same. It's it's they're both using this um, article. The one who loved me and who I'll say delivered. Delivered himself at Auton himself. Who bear for and it's for in the sense of like on behalf of okay. me. And Paul, he doesn't say mu, he says emu. For me. Okay, he's, he's emphasizing that. Okay, so, yeah, okay, so, let's put it together now. I have been crucified together with Christ, but I live. No longer I, but Christ lives in me. But what now I live in the flesh, so, but what, so this is going to be, I think of the King James Christ, but but what life I now live in the flesh, and they have to add the word life because what what is what I'm referring to, right? What thing I now live in the flesh, or that, and I think they're saying oh, it's referring to the life. He's talking about living. Do they really say that which? Let's see. Let's see. I, I, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yeah, not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they add life there because all the lives yeah. and that is what he's talking about is what i'm what i'm doing right now um i live in the flesh um, um in the faith i live the of the son of god faith <laughs> i live or by the son of god faith or the faith in the son of god i live uh, the one who loved me and who delivered himself for me. So a couple of questions. One, one, first of all, is this, our perfect tense. So what's he saying? He's saying, I was crucified together with Christ in the past, and I'm in a present state where that's true, mm. of having been crucified. Yeah. Same thing he says in Romans 6. Right, reckon yourselves be dead to sin and alive unto God. He's saying the same thing here. Okay, in fact, what Paul is acting that out in Galatians two twenty. He's reckoning himself to be dead to sin and alive unto God. Wow, that's what he's doing, right? He's saying, "I have been crucified together with Christ." Right, and he says, "But I live." So, so this is talking about um, his standing that he has. Okay. Not his practice right now, but the fact that he has the standing of having been crucified with Christ. Okay. But but he lives still. So you say, well, you've been crucified. How come you're still breathing, right? Well, I, I still live. I'm still alive. But it's no longer I, but Christ who's living in me. And um, so he's, he says, yes, am I? So... I think what he's implying is my old man has died. My old identity, what I used to be, has died with Christ. But now I'm living, and it's Christ living in me now, which is the song, right? Christ living in me. Yeah. Um, but what the life now that I live in the flesh, so, so when he's talking about Christ living in him, he's not talking about regular everyday living of breathing and eating and you know going about your business he's talking about spiritually there christ lives in me but the life that i now live in the flesh okay just everyday life by faith of the, i live of the son of god so 
he's, I think, describing there what it means for Christ to live in him. He's saying, I, I, I'm living by faith in the Son of God. Now, here's a question. This is called, um, is it a subjective genitive, I think? And it, it's basically, so does, is he saying faith in the Son of God or the faith of the Son of God? Is he talking about his faith that he places in Christ or is he talking about the faith of Christ himself? And that's something that theologians argue about. And I, I, most people say uh, it's his own faith in Christ. Uh, Christ is, oh, it's the object of genitive. That's what it is. And so is he's the object of that faith. And, um, and Paul does that in several places. He uses that kind of interesting language. What the other side says is they say, well, he's talking about instead of faith in Christ, he's talking about the faithfulness of Christ for him. And I've, I've heard that. I think it's probably, no, his faith in Christ. But anyway, that's just an interesting thing that people debate about. And he's the one who loved me and who delivered himself for me. Um, this, when you have um, one article and two words, both modified by that same article, that's called a uh, Granville Sharp rule. Okay. <laughs> It's um, it's something that um, this guy Granville Sharp, back I think he was like in the 1600s in England or something, saw this in Greek New Testament, and it seems to be true that these are referring to the same person. And so um, you see that sometimes in the New Testament, where uh, the one place where that makes a big difference is um, in Ephesians. Or where he's talking about different gifts given to the church. And he says there, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And that's a, it has one article for pastors and teachers. And so the, the, the idea is that pastor and teacher is the same person rather than two separate offices. Um, and if there were two separate offices, they would have an article in front of pastors and an article in front of teachers. So that's, that's one place where you see that. You also see that some places, I think Granville Sharp was really arguing it because in verses that deal with the, the divinity of Christ, um, the my Lord and Savior or um, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or some, there's some places like that where it, it shows that Christ is the same as God, right? And so, yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, so. You know, I saw a couple of baptisms this weekend. Mm -hmm. And this, this verse, I didn't realize, drives home the point of baptism. Right. About being born again, you actually are. That took place on the cross. Yes. You and are. Then, act, baptism acts, acts this out. Yeah. Because I saw that this weekend, and I, I'd never associated this particular verse with um with baptism right now but it's one, one interesting thing too is that the context of this verse because a lot of times this is one that when i was a kid we memorized it there was a song actually mm -hmm. crucified with christ nevertheless i live and you and you so you just memorize it but not really looking at the context of it and the context of it is where paul is confronting peter because peter has not been he's he's um in antioch and he, when he was there originally, he was eating with the Gentiles. Then the Jews came and he stopped eating with the Gentiles. And Paul rebukes Peter for doing that and say, you're not living consistent with the gospel. Wow. And he says, um, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And, and the whole idea, I'm, I'm living by faith in the Son of God. Um, and the, what, what Peter was doing was not living consistent like with this, that idea. And so... Well, that's why I... it In my mind now, I associate this with baptism because it says what happens when you've been baptized, but it also gives you instructions for the future in a way, now go live in Christ. Yes. Yep, walk in newness of life. I mean, that that's a pretty powerful verse. 
Yes. Yep. So. Uh, would would Titus be one of the examples of the Grimble Shelf rule where it says um, the coming of our God? Oh, and we got in. I think so. I think so. Let me see. So he's asking about Titus. Let's see. Titus 2. From... Yeah, okay. Titus 2.13. And what was the, uh, he's asking about uh, what aspect of it? He's asking about that Granville Sharp rule. Uh-huh. And yeah, it says, it says, um, let me see here. Um, the, the, um, the glorious appearing of um, the great, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it has, it has, um, one article for great God and for Savior. They share the same article. And so that, that would be a case of that. So Jesus is our God and our Savior. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So it's not saying the Father and Jesus. It's no. Just Jesus. Yes. Right. Because it's a glorious appearing of him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think I might have thought of another example. Perfect tense in mm -hmm. Revelation, mm -hmm. where it says, uh, "The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms." Of yeah, where is that? That's uh, eleven fifteen. Okay, Revelation eleven fifteen. Okay, and there. Great voice came in heaven or happened in heaven saying um Agenato Pi Basilei, uh the kingdom of the Lord um the kingdom of the kingdoms of the world um Agenato that's, I think, just I think that's just a simple area, aorist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, again on to, uh, yeah, again on to. Yeah. I think it's just a simple aorist. Yeah, if it was um, so if it was perfect let's look, we got that vocabulary in our lesson. So it would be gegana, gegana. So yeah, it wouldn't. It would have the reduplication. It was yep, yep. Yeah, that one is is yeah. How do you translate that in English? Right. It's just. We can say they became. became, yeah, became um, of the Lord and of his Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But there's lots of examples of perfects in the New Testament that that um, do make a difference. Uh, in, in John 17, um, the the ones that the Father has given, Jesus says, and often, many times he'll use the perfect that Father has given to me, you know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had a question about um, theology, like about that concept of the Father giving them right. Christians to Christ. Right. So is the purpose, um, it might be both, but is the per is like the end the end goal for, because I've heard it kind of both ways, I think, for Christians to be presented as a gift to Christ or for Christ to present them as a gift to his father. 
because I've heard, I think, commentators say that they do both, like the right one say one, one say the other. So Andrew's asking about the in where in John 17, where Jesus says the Father gave the disciples to him. Mm -hmm. Um, and is the purpose of that so that like in, in, in end times of the second coming. Right, that he can present them to God. Like perfected. Perfected or but like, like, like as in like Christ is a steward and God gives gives him Christians to see what he will do with them. And then he perfects them and presents them back to him. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. This is what I've done with what you've given me. I, I don't know. It's that. Right. I don't know. It's, 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 um, I mean, it might be something more along the lines of marriage, mm -hmm. right? The father giving, yeah, a bride to his son. Um, it, it might be just the, nothing in the, in that, talks about marriage if he doesn't bring up the concept of marriage there but definitely there's a concept of unity so yeah yeah and definitely in revelation there's right marriage. in revelation you have it yeah and so yeah did, is, did jesus have was he thinking in terms of like a marriage analogy when he was praying that or i, I don't know it's a good question yeah what verse is that i want to look at that um Oh boy, it's 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 all through John seventeen. Okay. Yep, and and Jesus always throughout it he refers to the disciples as those whom the Father has given, and usually using perfect tense there. Well, just the notion of being given <laughs> to Jesus is pretty. Yeah. Is uh, pretty special. Yes. So the, the the marriage analogy does sound that rings to me. Yeah, yeah, it, it could very well be. Yeah. I, I think I, I think in like is it in Titus or maybe in one of the epistles or like Ephesians where he said talks about presenting them to himself. Yeah, I think so. There's that. Too. Yeah, yes, in Ephesians and five. Then it says it's a right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for the scripture and uh, the, the depth of it. And um, so uh, we just pray to bless the rest of our week now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.